I was expecting this trip up today. Um, thanks, President Allen. Uh, since 2013, Keith has been a licensed realtor in real estate, uh, continuing education instructor, having worked on a team and as a solo agent. He was a 2019 recipient, I believe, of the Peoria Area Association of Realtors Realtor of the Year, and has enjoyed serving on various committees and local and the local board of directors over the years. Work isn't everything to Keith. He met his wife, Jennifer, and him, she and their two boys live in Pekin. Um, and that's obviously the best part of his life, as Keith will be happy to tell you. Uh, Keith was an active duty Air Force Security Forces member from 2006 to 2011. And during his time in service, he deployed to Iraq twice and did a tour in Ecuador as well. Um, transition out of the military could be sometimes tough and Keith will say he's made it through easier than many other of his brothers and sisters in the military. Over the years, he's made it his uh, passion to help fellow veterans in life, whether that's uh, with PTSD, um, help finding a, a, a service dog, someone to listen to, financial educations, or buying a home with a VA loan. That's his passion. Um, he also is a volunteer, which is where I met Keith uh, years ago with the Greater Peoria Honor Flight. And um, that everything kind of led to him to create his own podcast called Battle Buddies, the Battle Buddy Podcast. And I'll throw a quick plug in for Keith as well. His, his podcast is up for an award in a couple of weeks with a lot of other uh, military-centric uh, podcast awards. So please uh, welcome Keith McKeever. Thank you, Brent. I don't think I really need to say much now. It's kind of covered all the bases. Um, but yeah, yeah, transition for me was a lot easier than a lot of people. Uh, and over the last couple of years, I started noticing certain things. Let me try put the slides here. So I created this presentation, Foundations of Veteran Success, from some things I noticed. Here we go. So, of course, there's my mugshot. Uh, that's my, my logo. You can catch the uh, podcast on iTunes, Google, Spotify, Anchor. Uh, I also videotape it, so it's on YouTube. So I'm not actually used to talking to a big group of people like this. I'm usually looking at the camera and one other person on the screen. So this is a little unique for me. To know my story, you kind of got to go back a little bit. The uh, picture on the left is is my mother and my father. Um, my father tragically passed away when I was 16. He had cancer. Um, picture there. I'm, I'm the little one with the little blue sweater on. That's my half-brother and half-sister and my little rotten little sister. He picked on me as a kid. Uh, but, you know, I had a great childhood, pretty normal childhood, I guess. My, my parents were both realtors, so go figure. I got into real estate eventually. Um, but one of the things that was most important as a child is I remember going to parades and I remember my dad saying, hey, you got to stand up, put your hand over your heart, respect veterans, respect your police, you know, respect your elders, all those different things. One of the things that really stuck with me, uh, and after he passed away, the group picked on the right. Actually, I think I'm slightly cut off. My kids thought it was funny yesterday when I was showing them that I actually had hair at one point. Uh, but it was a good group of friends that rallied around me. Um, had a great, despite some tragedy, I had a great childhood growing up. Great group of friends to be around. And uh, unfortunately, uh, my father passed away in the fall of 2001. We all know what also happened in the fall of 2001 on September 11th. Unfortunately, we just had the uh, 21st anniversary of that. Uh, I was in Spanish class when that happened. Before that, I had never thought about military service. That was one of those things I think a lot of people that were my age were like, all right, where do we sign up? But I was 16, so that I wasn't going anywhere for a couple of years. So after a little while, all that kind of dies down. I go to college, went to ICC, uh, and eventually um, started learning a little bit more through ancestry stuff about some of my ancestors. So. Here's a picture of my grandfather, my dad's dad. He served in the army uh, in World War II. He was in Northern Italy and in the uh, black forests of Germany, somewhere in that area. He never really talked much about his service. My uncle actually told me about two years ago that a battle buddy of his would actually come to the family farm once or twice a year and they would walk out in the fields and they would come back crying. And that was his way of letting out some of his stress and his, his uh, issues. My other grandfather served uh, from 46 to 50 in the Army Air Corps, then later the Army or the Air Force. Uh, he was stationed in Alaska building buildings for radars. My father was drafted in Vietnam, but he did not serve. He, uh, I guess he got kind of lucky. He was allergic to penicillin and had asthma. And the Army said, we don't have much of a use for you. <laughs> and my stepfather, who was a big instrumental guy in me joining the Air Force, 
uh, served in, in Vietnam. Uh, he has a silver star, two purple hearts. And after I got my associate's degree, I sat around home one day and the army called me and I got all excited. I was like, oh, I can do that. I'm kind of bored, you know, didn't know if I wanted to go get my bachelor's degree or not, figuring out life, right, at 20. And he came home and he said, you know what happened when I was gone? I said, well, the army called and I'm thinking about joining. <laughs> And he looked at me, he goes, if you're going to join the military, you got to join the Navy or the Air Force. You want a quality of life. You want to sleep in dirt or you want to sleep in a hotel? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty smart. You know, I, can, uh, I like that hotel idea. So, you know, went and talked to the Air Force recruiter and the rest is history. Uh, so I did join the Air Force, went in as Air Force Security Forces. Uh, I had my stepfather actually pin my Security Forces badge on, which was a great honor. I, I couldn't have thought of anybody else. So he came all the way down to San Antonio to do that. My first duty station was in Japan. Uh, I wanted to be a cop. That's what my associate's degree was in. I kind of thought my first experience in a squad car would be a Ford Explorer or an Impala or something like that. No, it was a little Toyota car. I don't know if it even hit 60 miles an hour over there. Uh, I also had the opportunity to go down to Ecuador. Still very close friends with that group. Uh, there we are standing on the uh, on the equator. Awesome, amazing trip. Uh, and I also did deploy twice. And, you know, just to show that there is kind of a funny side to war. Uh, this is a promotion ceremony for one of our lieutenants. And uh, we did take a serious picture too. Not everybody randomly pointing in one direction. So uh, the video didn't work. So my first deployment was in a place called Kambuka. It was a prison camp. Uh, when I got there in early 2007, there was about 9,000 prisoners of war there. When I left uh, at the end of September of that year, there was conservative estimates of about 23,000 prisoners there. We had guys in our compound that were locked up for curfew violations, bomb building, the money men. We had one gentleman who was a professor of something at a university in around Baghdad. Um, who was a gentleman that looked exactly like Saddam Hussein, uh, probably a distant relative. I don't really know for sure. So it was a very, very interesting place where we had a lot of things that happened. We ran out of food occasionally. We got down to MREs. And if you've ever eaten an MRE for military food period, you don't want to. It's definitely not very delicious. Um, but we had a lot of indirect fire, riots, escape attempts. It was pretty, pretty crazy, crazy place. Um, not exactly like a prison that you'd expect in the United States, um, but it was, uh, it was home for almost eight months. Uh, second deployment that I did uh, was Joint Base Balad, which is totally different. Kambuka had about 3,000 allied personnel. There was about 30,000, so roughly the population of Pekin that was there. It was a big base and it had just about every aircraft you could possibly imagine. Uh, did entry control there. One of the sad parts about that job is that deployment was much easier than the first one, but unfortunately saw a lot of vehicles come in like this. And it's a very, very difficult thing to see, you know, especially in your early 20s, because you know that somebody was in that driver's seat and that gunner seat and that, that truck commander seat. And, and you know that they, they, they may have not come out in one piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very hard thing to see. And we also had burn pits at that location. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the burn pits, but it's kind of the post 9-11 generation's version of Agent Orange. They would burn literally everything from tires to batteries to medical waste. Uh, there was really no landfills. Just dump it in there, put jet fuel on it, light it, and let it go. And I share some of the stuff just to, that's just my story. There's 19 million veterans roughly in the United States uh, and Gulf War veterans that have served sometime in the last 30 years, about 8.2 million. So there's a lot of veterans, especially young veterans who've been around those kind of things and exposed to those things. And it comes with physical and mental health issues. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, depending on how you look at it, eventually you transition out of the military. My transition was pretty easy, but you may be surprised to know that the transition assistance program that the government runs is actually ran by the Department of Labor, not the VA, not the Department of Defense. So their tax, as they call it, um, is more employment based. That's basically the four different things that they op, uh, operate there. So employment fundamentals, wounded warrior care and caregiver care, uh, employment workshops, career and credential exploration. That's great. When I got out, it was basically that stuff. And it was create a LinkedIn, create your resume, go get a job, be a productive member of society, which is great. But what about everything else? Uh, the other resources that are available are basically left up to nonprofits to do. And I've heard somewhere there's about 50,000 veteran based nonprofits across the United States. So there's a lot of nonprofits, big and small, that are just trying to make an impact and do something to, uh, to fill in those gaps. So my transition, I, like I said, I, I got out pretty easy. I got out 2011. 
That's my wife and my two sons, Isaiah and Braxton. I starved rock a couple of years ago. They are, like Brent said, that's, I mean, that family is everything, family first. Uh, that's my mother, who was my business partner for a few years, both realtors. Um, and then I just got my degree last year. So for me, transition was pretty easy, but not everybody has it that way. And kind of, you know, family, job, education, kind of taking advantage of those benefits, but a lot of people fall flat on their face, unfortunately. Uh, but a few years ago, I think it was eight years ago, something like that. I, I don't know, years go by. But uh, actually, the first event that I ever went to with Honor Flight was with Brent. It was out at the... Uh, summer. Yeah, 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 summer part of the part, yeah. World War II reenactment that they do out there just about every year. I met him. I met John Myers. It was raining earlier that day. Nobody came out to that entire event. I sat down for like two hours with these guys to volunteer, and I was hooked. Uh, since then, I've had an opportunity to go on the honor flight, I think, eight times. This uh, officer in D.C. was dressed as Rosalie the Riveter. She was a huge hit. I got to go as a guardian once for a gentleman uh, from South of Pekin, uh, Terry Flanders. Got to go to schools, talk to children about what Honor Flight does, what what it means to these veterans. Uh, we unfortunately don't find a lot of World War II veterans anymore, but for those guys, it was a last thank you, you know, for their generation, for their service. The Korean War is kind of known as the Forgotten War. Uh, it's an opportunity to let them know that their service is not forgotten. And I think we all pretty much know how the Vietnam veterans were treated when they came back. And for them, it's an opportunity to say, "Welcome home. We appreciate what you did, and we're not forgetting that either." And then just a few a couple weeks ago, I actually got to take my oldest son, Isaiah, on our flight. We had a last minute cancellation and the director said, hey, would your 12 year old like to go? And I said, uh, I don't think he's going to complain about not being at school on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so he was all about it. At, uh, out of all the trips, that one was the best to be able to share that with my son. Um, no, nobody in my family had ever been to D.C. other than me. So it was a great opportunity. And then what, what led to the podcast uh, as a realtor, I know Leslie would probably says too, you're on the road for 15, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour. It's a lot of time. Um, I like music, but I like podcasts for a long time. I listened to a bunch of different podcasts. And when everything kind of slowed down there for a second and Honor Flight was kind of ripped away from me, uh, it was one of the, because we didn't fly for two years, it was like, okay, what's next? What, how can I give back? So I decided to create a podcast. My wife, I got to thank her for the logo. She did all that work. Uh, I can't take any kind of creative handy work. So she did all that for me and started the podcast, started slow. I interviewed a local guy about his his battle with traumatic brain injury, PTSD, his suicide attempts, multiple suicide attempts. That was episode one, and I knew immediately we had a hit. But the reason that I noticed all this, um, I noticed a lot of these issues was from Facebook. I'm sure everybody in here, if you're on Facebook, you're probably in a few Facebook groups. I'm in probably 12, 15 different veteran Facebook groups. And I noticed some some terrible trends. Uh, you know, these were actually taken as screenshots this month. I built these slides about a week ago. So these came from various Facebook groups that I'm in in the first week of this month. Like, I'm struggling with depression, anxiety. How do you make it through the day? Uh, the bottom one here talks about uh, being denied for, for different treatments since 2020. You know, then you got the, the really one that was powerful for me is just the one that simply says, I'm really struggling right now. I noticed for years that there was people in these groups all the time struggling with different issues, which is one of the reasons I decided to create the podcast. Uh, that and the honor flight not being around, something to fill, fill my time and give back. So what I've noticed is there's kind of these pillars to success. And if you think about it like a house, if the foundation's not there, the roof is gonna collapse. And unfortunately, the collapse for a lot of veterans is substance abuse, suicide, or homelessness. Suicide gets a lot of the press, homelessness gets a little bit less, but a lot of people aren't talking about the, the substance abuse issues in the, in the veteran community. So what I've decided, or what I've realized is the financial issues are a big factor to that. It's financial and legal. Um, there's a lot of veterans get out, they don't even have a budget. You know, you join the military at 18. Let's just say you get out at 22. The military gives you X amount of dollars per month. That's what you got to spend. You don't really need a budget. You got the chow hall to go to for food. You got transportation around the base. You don't really need much. So some basic financial education isn't even there for some veterans. Post family relationships is another one. A lot of posts on Facebook about dealing with divorce, loss of family members, children, uh, strange relationships with children and other relatives. Physical and mental health, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of issues there. And employment is another one. I see a lot of people that just, they're not in the right job. 
they don't know what to do. They don't know what their purpose in his life, uh, purpose in life is. And then the last one is lack of connection to the community. And I think that's one of the, the key ones. But no matter which one, when more or more than one of those is not there, the more likelihood that that person falls into suicidal thoughts, substance abuse, or, or homelessness. So my mission through the podcast is to educate and inspire veterans to improve their lives. And I do that as an interview style podcast. So I bring for the most part one guest. I did have two ladies on uh, that own a business and talked about their business and partnership, but just to talk about their experiences and their businesses or their nonprofit, those different things. Uh, so some of the past topics we've talked about are very difficult topics, suicide attempts, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, other big ones on there, mental health, military sexual trauma, um, book reviews, homelessness, nonprofit highlights. So I had a lot of different conversations. So far, I've released 68 episodes and counting. I've had uh, 14 interviews with veteran nonprofits from around the country. Uh, I've interviewed active duty military members, veterans, and civilians that are involved in nonprofits and other things. And Brent mentioned the Veteran Podcast Awards. I don't honestly know how I won top podcast uh, Air Force podcast of the year last year um, must have been dumb luck or somebody was out there voting on my on my behalf I, I appreciate it either way but the campaign for for this year is going I honestly don't really care too much about it it's 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 a great pat on the back if I get voted to to win but just sharing it and getting it out there and more people being aware of my podcast is where it has an impact on people's lives uh, local impact you know it's it's a podcast so people can listen anywhere and I'll share a short story without names or anything like that, but uh, in and around my neighborhood in Pekin, uh, about maybe nine months ago, somebody reached out to my wife and said, hey, I know your husband's a veteran. Um, do you know anything about PTSD or things like that? This, this guy had been in a very difficult situation when he was in the Navy and he was struggling and she had not served. They had married later in life and didn't know anything about PTSD or dealing with it was lost. So she goes, well, you know, my husband has a podcast. She goes, no, I don't. So he, she messaged me. I, I knew her too. And I was able to share about five or six different episodes and some resources with her. I never would have thought in a million years that doing this podcast that can be listened to anywhere on a streaming device that I have an impact in my own neighborhood. But um, that's when it, it kind of got real for me. I'm like, wow, it, you never know how it's going to impact somebody. So what I could use help with is if anybody in here is a veteran, if you like podcasts, listen to it. If you've got family members that are veterans, share it with them. And it's all about just helping them better their lives. You know, maybe they're not to that point of suicide or substance abuse, but they might be struggling with something that one of the topics might, uh, might be beneficial for. So that's, and my website's down there at the bottom. And like I said, it's, you can see it on those, those platforms. So is there any questions? Yes. How long are your episodes typically? That's I don't really stick to an actual time. Okay. I have had them as short as about 25 minutes, and I had one talking about uh, nonprofits uh, that went almost two hours. So it was a little long. I was a little excessive. Most of them are about 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there. Any other questions? Yes. Now, your, your logo is awesome. I noticed it right away. So nice job to your wife. For yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll give her the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yes, sir. How many times a week or a month did you have the program? I release an episode every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yep, and it's it's on my website. Uh, the latest one is on the main page. I keep the last five episodes in video format and the audio on there that I have an archive of it. All my past guests, I keep their headshot on there and a link, a link to their LinkedIn profile. So you can reach out to them and whatever somebody needs, they can connect with them. How do you find uh, a lot of your guests? In the beginning stages, there was a there's a Facebook group I'm in called the Entrepreneur Tribe. So veteran entrepreneurs, uh, there's about I think 16,000 members or so in there. So I got a lot of from there. And there's a mastermind group underneath of that. So a lot of my guests have been from there. Not from there, and from there, I've I've had past guests email me out of the blue and say, "Hey, I need to talk to this person." I've had random emails, things through my website. So Found them all over the place. Are you connected with a couple of years ago? I think it was before COVID, there was a gentleman um, that came in here that had service dogs and a number of freedom pause. Freedom, freedom pause, yeah. I interviewed them. I think their episode came out in the last okay. two months or so. Yeah. Yep. And actually the first the first guest I had on 
uh, went through them with their current service dog. Jeff Sykes was my first guest. Yes, sir. First, congratulations on your ICC associate degree. <laughs> Thank you. I figured there was a connection there. What do you do if you meet up with someone in just casual conversation or, or the like? And what advice would you give if you really cheer for them? They're um, suicidal or whatever. Uh, what do you reckon? I mean, they haven't had training in suicide. Yeah, no, I don't have any training in that. But. So, what advice would you give if you happen to confront somebody, even casually? Who's having what you believe to be serious? I think one of the best things you can do is just sit and listen. Don't try and make things worse and, and talk. And if you feel like you know there's a serious threat there, I guess maybe you know call the authorities if that person needs to be taken into custody. I, I don't, I don't, you know, what I mean, it, it, I guess it depends. On, are they losing it to the point of being homicidal or threatened to somebody else, or is it to them? That, that's a good question. I have not ran into that. I've had a few people come on and talk about that stuff, but that, that would be, I would love personally to have some sort of training like that. I think, I think a lot of people should. There's a lot of people out there that are struggling. It's not just veterans. You never know when you can run into somebody. So, On your uh, Facebook page, Freedom Pause just posted um, dial 988 for assistance, the suicide and crisis hotline. Yeah, they just changed that number. So it made it a lot easier, 988. Press one, and then I think the text number is eight three eight two five five, something like that. There's a text number for for people who are suicidal. I do share that. Actually, that's the ending slide of, of each one of my episodes. I, I put that on there on my website. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks again for inviting me. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you.